Welcome to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network's webinar, Integrative Oncology for Pancreatic Cancer Patients. My name is Cassidy Moravic, and I am the Senior Manager of Clinical Initiatives for the organization. At the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, our goal is to provide you with better resources so that you can make informed decisions. A patient central associate can provide you with personalized information free of charge on topics such as diet, nutrition, and treatment options. Contact Patient Central at 877-272-6226 or email at patientcentral at pancan.org. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor, Lilly Oncology. We would also like to thank our dedicated partners in progress listed on the next slide. This webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes and includes a presentation followed by a Q&A session. A recording of this presentation and the slides will be available under the educational events page at pancan.org. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Richard Lee is a hematologist and oncologist and provides routine oncologic care in addition to broad consultative ser services regarding supportive and integrative oncology at university hospitals Seidman Cancer Center in Cleveland, Ohio. He is the inaugural Parker Hannafin Helen Moss Cancer Research Foundation Professor of Integrative Oncology, the Director of Supportive and Integrative Oncology, and the Director of Case Center for Integrative Oncology. In these roles, he develops and oversees the clinical, research, and educational programs related to supportive and integrative approaches to cancer. Dr. Lee, I will turn the presentation over to you. Great. Thank you, Cassidy. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Chris and the whole uh, Pancreatic uh, Cancer Action Network uh, for inviting me to speak with you this afternoon, and uh, thank all of you for joining and uh, taking your time um, to hear this presentation. Um, today I'll be focusing on the role of supportive and integrative oncology for pancreatic cancer patients. Here. Okay. And so our objectives today are to uh, review the terms alternative, complementary, and integrative medicine, uh, be familiar uh, with a comprehensive approach, and to know how supportive and integrative approaches may benefit you. And so we'll be covering some background and principles of the field, looking at the current uh, current clinical model here at Seidman Cancer Center, and then thinking about how you can create your own supportive and integrative oncology plan as part of your care. So as we think about the field, uh, it has really evolved over the past 20-plus uh, years. Um, now the National Institutes of Health has a center that was just recently renamed to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Previously, it was called, uh, it started as the Office of Alternative Medicine in the 1990s, then uh, became a National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine, uh, and now has become NCCIH. Uh, and really when they define uh, what they call complementary integrative, it's really looking at approaches outside the mainstream of Western or conventional medicine. And they have several categories when you think about this. Uh, it's often termed CAM, or complementary alternative medicine. And we look at things like natural products, which most commonly are supplements, vitamins, minerals, can also be herbal products, uh, mind-body interventions such as meditation, prayer, relaxation techniques, uh, manipulative or body-based uh, therapies such as chiropractic or massage, and then uh, a wide variety of other types of uh, therapies uh, like energy healing, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic, other whole medical systems that exist uh, throughout the world. So when we really think about these terms, alternative, complementary, and integrative, they're often used interchangeably, but they are vastly different, really. Um, so when we think about alternative, we're really talking about a treatment that is used in place of conventional medicine. So, for example, I met a patient once who, uh, with diagnosis of cancer, decided to go to Mexico to receive uh, alternative therapy. So that was really alternative therapy. Um, you know, for example, if you were to use acupuncture to treat your cancer instead of surgery or chemotherapy, that would be using acupuncture as an alternative. While most people probably use 
these types of uh, therapies in a complementary manner. So using both a herbal product or acupuncture to treat your cancer as well as using chemotherapy or surgery or radiation. So you're using them all together. But integrative medicine is, is uh, significantly different uh, in terms of how we use these types of treatments. Now, when we think about integrative medicine, a uh, definition that's widely accepted is from a consortium, academic consortium of integrative medicine and health, uh, of which includes most major uh, universities like Harvard, Mayo Clinic, Duke, um, here, uh, University of Hospitals is part of this organization, includes over 50 uh, ma major institutions. And they define integrative medicine as that uh, type of medicine that reaffirms the relationship between practitioner and patient, looking at the whole person, informed by evidence, and making use of all appropriate therapeutic approaches, providers, disciplines to achieve optimal health and healing. And I think what's key and uh, really differentiates this from a complementary alternative approach, it has to be evidence-based. And secondly, really only using all appropriate therapy. So not using everything that's available, but thinking about which one is most appropriate based on the evidence that exists for different therapies. Now, there are many different reasons why people might seek out uh, alternative therapies, including children uh, often are wanting different alternatives to a shot. Um, but let's take a step back and look at um, a kind of the issue at hand when we're dealing with cancer and um, patients are feeling ill, are then seeking medical help and diagnosed with cancer, which is impacting how they feel. Of course, we have a variety of different options, including chemotherapy, surgery, radiation. Now, immunotherapies are a, a new uh, category of treatments that can help treat the cancer and ultimately help the patient. But many of these therapies, including everything I've uh, mentioned, has its own side effects and in itself can affect the patient. Um, and so if we're having to reduce the dose or delay treatment because of these side effects, then, of course, uh, we aren't able to uh, adequately treat the cancer. So when we think of palliative care, really supportive care, it's thinking about how do we help uh, boost the patient and minimize those side effects while they're going through treatment. And as we learn more about cancer, we understand it's not just the cancer, it's the microenvironment, such as the blood vessels, or uh, as we talk about immunotherapy, so the immune system plays an important role. All these are important factors as we think about treatment options. We also want to be thinking about what else we can do that's not so much directed at the cancer, but directed at the patient. And how do we help support the patient? And I think that's really where uh, integrative oncology fits in as well, uh, in a kind of slightly different manner. And can we help support the patient so that they themselves are better able to also fight against the cancer, as well as are there are ways we can make chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation, or immunotherapies more effective as well, and ultimately to uh, cure patients of cancer. So how do we best achieve this goal of supporting patients? And I think uh, one of the shifts in thinking is, as we think of supportive and integrative care, is uh, rather than having a passive patient, is really having an active patient who is as engaged in their treatment plan to make them also f help fight against the cancer. Now, m when I see patients in clinic, most often I get questions of this sort when I'm asked about an integrative approach. So uh, this is a patient who uh, was diagnosed with cancer and said, I need an integrative approach and I need to work on my nutrition. And I said, that's great. I think nutrition is important. And when I asked specifically about his nutrition, he took out his bag of supplements. Uh, and so these are all the supplements that the patient was taking. And this is another good example uh, of a patient who is taking a variety of different, what they would call an integrative approach, but what I would really call a complementary approach, where they're pursuing surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, as well as taking a variety of different, uh, quote unquote, natural things. Um, but I think that uh, we have to be careful about how we look at these supplements and are they really that natural. As you can see on this list, this is just his morning list. He had an afternoon list. He also had a evening list. And so he was taking over 100 pills a day. Many, uh, many of these supplements were, were, were duplicates of each other. Um, and so I think we have to think about these approaches very carefully and, and think about how evidence-based they are and how appropriate they are. Uh, I caution um, patients commonly about where they might be getting their advice. So uh, just last week I had a patient uh, bring me a book 
uh, written by a family practice physician about how to cure cancer. And uh, I really questioned about the source of information. Um, you know, when you are seeking consultation for, uh, you have cardiovascular disease, you've just had a heart attack, um, it wouldn't be wise to seek advice uh, from someone like myself who, although I am a physician, I, I'm not an expert in cardiovascular health and how to manage uh, patients with a heart attack and you wouldn't want me to do your heart surgery. Uh, you really want an expert who's handling you know, cardiac cases on a daily basis. You want a surgeon who's operating in the heart every day. So same way when you're dealing with cancer, you really want an expert in cancer, not somebody who just happens to have a PhD or an MD. And uh, you'd be surprised how often when I investigate these books, uh, how the patient might, or the author might have a PhD in English or in philosophy or in physics, but not really in cancer biology. So uh, I think, think very carefully about where you're getting your information. And then also think about the level of evidence you're getting. Are you getting an expert opinion? And sometimes it's just an opinion, not from an expert. Uh, and then are we really comparing apples and oranges or apples and apples, meaning that are we comparing a treatment that has had randomized double controlled double-blind studies versus a, a therapy that's being based on an animal research study in the laboratory. Uh, I think those are really two different types of approaches and levels of evidence. So um, I just want to emphasize it's important to have high-quality evidence as we base our therapies. Um, patients often say that these therapies might be natural, but I think you have to uh, think of them more like medicines. Um, and in that way, they might impact your treatment efficacy, and we'll talk about this uh, in particular. Uh, it can also impact patient safety, and we'll talk about examples of how supplements have actually could cause more damage than they do uh, good. Um, and it's also never good to hide things from your medical team. It's important for them to understand what your needs are and uh, what they can do for you. Um, and then also the economics, time, and energy as well, especially if you're dealing with a very advanced cancer uh, do you want to spend your time and energy traveling to Mexico or a different country seeking an alternative therapy? Um, that may or may not be the best approach. Now, as we think about these uh, supplements, um, you know, are they really natural? I think you have to rethink that uh, kind of misconception about supplements being natural. Um, many of our chemotherapies, uh, including those using pancreatic cancer, are based on natural plants. So what is really natural, what is uh, processed medicine, uh, I think really they're all the same if they're uh, processed. So uh, things like, you know, uh, Abraxane, which is nat paclitaxel, paclitaxel is actually based on the U-bark tree, uh, and that's where it was derived, and many other chemotherapies are coming from plants. Uh, and so I think it's important to remember that. And how often do we see pills growing on plants? Uh, I have a lot of patients tell me, oh, my, my supplement is organic and it's all natural. Um, but I tell them, well, it's still made in a factory somewhere and they still use chemicals to create a pill. Um, there is no pill that's quote unquote natural. So really, I think we gotta consider these things as medicines rather than uh, all natural supplements with no harms. Um, even Consumer Reports a few years ago had an article uh, talking about the dangers of supplements um, and I, I think we often forget because we're, uh, we're bombarded with marketing that says they have no side effects, or they're perfectly safe, and they're all natural. Uh, but I think it's important to realize that the supplement industry itself is not really very regulated. So this is a, a chart that highlights some of the differences uh, between uh, those things that are uh, FDA regulated versus supplements which go under a different a jurisdiction, really almost no jurisdiction. So when you talk about, say, things like efficacy, um, these companies aren't required to show any proof that these supplements do anything. Uh, when you talk about safety, uh, again, they aren't required to show that their product is safe. The FDA has to show that it's unsafe before they can do anything. The dosing, uh, there's no standardized dosing. And then lastly, I think quality control, and I'm gonna show examples of all these, uh, is required for all prescription medications, but not required for supplements. So there's a, a wide variety of key differences uh, between these types of medicines. And so, uh, although the, you know people often complain about the FDA not being perfect, um, remember that all these supplements 
uh, can say they cure cancer, detoxify the body, make you younger, make you smarter, but they always have a disclaimer on the back that basically says, we say it cures cancer, but you know, you're not supposed to use it to cure any disease. Uh, and these are required um, uh, statements, disclosures that they have on all the bottles, or they're supposed to have it on all the bottles. Now, one of the uh, things I always remind patients about is, um, mo you know, supplements, uh, especially vitamins and minerals, well, patients say, well, can't be harmful. You need it as part of your uh, required nutritional intake, which is true, but um, whether or not it's safe for a cancer patient is a different issue. Um, one of the first chemotherapies ever developed was uh, developed by a gentleman named Sidney Farber. Um, you, many of you may have heard of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which is part of the Harvard system. Uh, Sidney Farmer is uh, famous because he helped develop one of the first chemotherapies in the 1940s. And if you look at this article in New England Journal in 1948, the reason he came upon a, a drug which was a folic acid antagonist, meaning it blocks folate metabolism, uh, he discovered it because he was thinking that his patients, his kids with leukemia, were malnourished. And so he gave them extra folate uh, shots. He gave them folic acid shots. And what he found was that when you give a patient with leukemia folic acid, the leukemia will actually grow faster. Uh, and that is because, remember, these cancer cells are trying to grow rapidly. So they're going to uptake any kind of nutrients that normal cells need because they want to keep dividing. And so what he realized is that if you give folic acid to a patient with leukemia, it will grow faster. So he said, well, what if I block folate metabolism? And that's how he came up with this uh, chemotherapy at the time called am uh, aminopterin. And that later led to the use of methotrexate, which we still use today for many lymphomas, leukemias, uh, and sometimes it, many years ago it was still used for many solid uh, uh, tumors as well. So when you look at uh, herbs and supplements, there have been multiple examples now where we have found that things like beta carotene, vitamin E, can actually cause more harm than benefit. So let's look at some examples. This is one of the uh, randomized trials where uh, they actually tried to prevent lung cancer in patients at high risk, and actually what they found here was that patients on who were receiving uh, beta-carotene vitamin A ended up with more lung cancers than the placebo arm. And on the right side, what you also notice is that patients who received these antioxidants ended up having higher uh, all-cause mortality, including more heart attacks and strokes. Now, we're not sure why that happened, but it was a pretty clear um, increase in harm. And there was another study uh, that was published just a few years after this one, also using beta-carotene, and showed exactly the same result, meaning that patients had more cancer and more deaths taking these types of antioxidants. Uh, this is a study done in head and neck cancer where patients were given antioxidants, uh, beta-carotene, uh, vitamin E to prevent side effects and to reduce their risk for recurrence. Uh, unfortunately, what you see here is the placebo arm, which is the dotted line, versus the solid arm, which is um, uh, the supplement arm. The placebo arm actually had a better survival rate than the antioxidant arm. So again, demonstrating that there can be interactions between treatment, in this case radiation, and also a long-term follow-up shows they actually had more cancers recurring than those who did not uh, or those who got the placebo pill. Um, there have also been reports of things like these supplements causing damage, like kava-kava uh, causing liver damage. There can be contamination. We'll talk more about this. And don't forget that these medicines can cause drug-drug interactions. Uh, these are just some examples of case reports, um, green tea causing liver toxicity. I get almost a question probably once a month uh, about uh, apricot seeds and whether they cure cancer. Or do they kill cancer? They do, but they also kill normal cells. It actually contains cyanide. So if anyone says take laetrile, vitamin B17, or, uh, or uh, apricot seeds, remember it has cyanide. Uh, and so many of these products uh, have real dangers, even though they're, they are natural, uh, quote, unquote. Um, this is a very interesting study where they actually did some DNA testing on natural products from uh, several different herbal companies. And what they found was that the majority of these products actually contain filler. Filler is yellow. Product substitution, solid red. Uh, dotted red is contaminant. So what you would prefer to see is a lot of blue, which is authentic product. But only two companies made, uh, this one here, G and C, made products that had pure authentic product. 
Uh, it's shocking to see some companies had all contamination here. Uh, some have a mix of filler, product substitution contaminants. So your chances of getting a real quality product, uh, at least in the United States, is probably less than 50%. You look at all companies. In this case, you know most companies, not even 50%, were making a good product, uh, unfortunately. And uh, these uh, compounds are quite complex. So this is a study from Memorial Sloan Kettering, from uh, Barry Castle's group, Gary Dang, and others, showing that when you took a, mu uh, a mushroom extract uh, and you looked at it, its effects on um, immune system, even though it does have immune modulatory effects at very high doses, you can see that the effects tends to go away. Um, it's not clear if you kept increasing the dose even higher would it actually have a negative effect. Uh, and then also in this paper they showed that not all types of immune cells were stimulated. Some immune cells were actually suppressed. So when you use a natural product such as a mushroom, which contains hundreds of compounds, it probably has hundreds of different effects, some of which might be beneficial, some of which might not be. So let's think about uh, what is a different uh, model or approach to this field. Uh, and so our model really focuses on what we call a whole person approach, um, something um, often called the biopsychosocial model, where we really want to look at your overall health and well-being in three major dimensions. And this is um, first proposed by George Engel in 1977. Uh, our model, we want to not only treat the cancer, but we want to treat the patient. And so uh, we want to be able to use all the important uh, evidence-based uh, conventional therapies like surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, stem cell transplant for certain types of diseases, immunotherapies. Uh, but we also want to support the patient. Uh, there's two sides to the coin, and they go hand in hand. Uh, and so we want to incorporate things like palliative medicine, nutrition, physical activity, exercise. In the psychospiritual realm, do we need psychiatry, psychology, chaplaincy, as well as social support with social workers, navigators, education support groups, and lastly, also thinking about um, integrative approaches, and I think these fit in nicely as another important um, treatment options for patients that help both not only physical symptoms but the uh, psycho-spiritual component of every patient's health. Um, let's focus on really some of the core basics of your physical health, which is about nutrition uh, and physical activity. Uh, and this is from the American Institute of Cancer Research, um, just estimating how many cancers we could prevent. And so overall, we could probably prevent a third of, uh, of can all cancers in America just through healthy eating, uh, exercising. And if you look at pancreatic cancer, they estimate about 39% of pancreatic cancers could probably be prevented if all Americans were practicing good nutrition and exercise. So that's a substantial amount. And as we think about risk factors, we often think about alcohol and smoking as major risk factors. But after those two, is now thought that obesity or our physical health or poor physical health, it will probably be the third major risk factor in America, and it's increasing as smoking rates go down. Uh, if you look at obesity rates uh, in general, you can see they've been climbing for the last 30-plus uh, years. And so what are the recommendations from the American Cancer Society? Uh, there are really uh, five major ones. Um, that we need to consider. One is, do you have a healthy body weight? And you have to think about your body mass index. Uh, are you exercising regularly? What they recommend is 150 minutes per week of a moderate intensity exercise. Are you eating healthy? Uh, five servings of fruits and vegetables per day, limited processed foods, um, and then limiting alcohol, and then actually the other one would be uh, tobacco. Okay, so um, no tobacco, I mean, no um, no tobacco, limiting alcohol, eating healthy, regular exercise, and uh, managing your weight. And this has been shown to reduce the risk of cancer in a variety of different studies. Now let's look at the effects specifically in pancreatic cancer. This is a study over 10 years ago just looking at how um, being overweight or obese might affect your outcomes once you're diagnosed. Uh, and so they split this up into men and women. And what you can see here, what you want to focus on is in pancreatic cancer, Patients who have a body mass index of greater than 35 have more than a two times likelihood of dying uh, than patients who have a normal weight. And in uh, women, it's similar, 2.76. So really, uh, over a two and a half times risk, increased risk of death uh, just by uh, being at a higher uh, body mass index. I'm just gonna switch gears here a little bit. 
and uh, also talk about uh, just briefly about what other integrative options you might want to think about uh, in your treatment plan, um, especially in the area of symptom management. So uh, acupuncture uh, has been shown to be helpful in clinical trials uh, for things like pain and nausea, which are common in, in pancreatic cancer patients. Uh, also can help address things like xerostomia, hot flashes, fatigue, neuropathy. Uh, I think there's some preliminary data for insomnia, although not much, but uh, something else to consider. Um, we also wanted to think about uh, uh, therapies like massage, which has been shown to help with mood disturbance, uh, especially patients who have high stress levels and, and often carry that physically, uh, helping with pain, constipation. And some groups are looking at uh, massage to help with neuropathy symptoms. Uh, music therapy is another great uh, modality uh, to help with stress, mood disturbance, uh, quality of life. So these kind of mind-body practices like yoga, meditation, uh, have also been helpful for stress, quality of life, insomnia. There's actually some data that we'll talk about later about how these uh, things can help. So let's uh, jump into uh, thinking about how um, these uh, therapies can be brought together and you can create your own uh, plan that's going to be right for you. So let's uh, build your plan. So a couple of principles to think about. Uh, think about real natural options. So in thinking about instead of more pills, can we think about more healthy foods and an exercise program? Uh, these things are truly natural. And then balance. Uh, remember, more is not always a, a better. Um, so let's look at some risk factors um, that are specific to pancreatic cancer. This is a recent uh, meta-analysis. So start, starting from the top, uh, for anyone who might still be smoking, I think that by far and away is the most important thing any patient can do to reduce the risk for recurrence or prevent um, cancer is staying away from tobacco. Uh, next in the list here is, I would say, focusing on you know, things like diabetes and obesity. So I think these are closely related. So we talked a lot about that data. Uh, reducing the intake of processed meat or red meat, alcohol. So these are all uh, modifiable risk uh, factors that you can control yourself. Okay, and then down here, these are things that are actually helpful. So they talk about physical activity, increasing fruit uh, or folic intake through food, not through, uh, through pills. So uh, again, healthy eating and physical activity, and we'll go through more of that data. So really have some uh, small steps and goals and then think long-term as well. Uh, think about you know, what the quality of your, say, nutrition is or your exercise and how often and then find things that you enjoy. So don't force yourself to eat things that you really don't like um, or do an exercise program that you don't want. So assess your needs, work with your medical team, and then set goals. Uh, and so we'll be talking about all these different areas, such as physical, mind, spiritual, and social support. Again, um, this is an interesting study looking at both how your weight, as measured by body mass index, as well as your physical activity, so who was exercising the most versus the least. So even if you are, say, overweight, if you're exercising uh, regularly, you can reduce that risk versus those who are overweight and not exercising, they clearly do the worst. So um, these are important risk factors that we can modify. Um, you have more data specifically in pancreatic cancer talking about the risk um, and, and uh, survival in pancreatic patients, especially those who are obese. Um, with a BMI of over 40, you see that risk is uh, consistently increased uh, for patients. And uh, things like metabolic syndrome, um, which is patients who generally have diabetes or overweight, uh, high cholesterol, you can see they actually do significantly worse than those patients who are healthy. When you think about nutrition, I often tell patients about it's not only about the quality of the food you're eating, but the quantity. Uh, are you making healthier choices, and, and how are you eating your food? Uh, are you sitting down with uh, your family and taking your time? Are you kind of uh, someone who just eats lunch in five minutes on the go and just looking for the simplest uh, kind of fast food that's out there? Um, think about the different categories of the foods, most importantly fruits and vegetables. You want five to six servings a day. Uh, how much protein, carbohydrates, fats and oils are you intaking? And really limit your processed foods. Limit uh, those foods which are, tend to be high-calorie, low-nutritional value. So uh, a good example would be a candy bar. Um, very high calories, lots of uh, processed sugars in there. Uh, but if you look at the 
vitamin and mineral content will be very low. Um, the counterpart to that would be an apple, which is uh, relatively low calorie but has a lot of nutrition, uh, and then limiting alcohol. So when I patients often ask me, well, how am I going to get my vitamins and minerals? I say, well, you need to be taking the most natural vitamin, which is an apple or an avocado or a banana or you know fruits and vegetables. These are the best uh, uh, supplements, natural supplements that you can take, um, rather than taking a pill. And so really focusing on natural sources. Um, and I know there's a lot of marketing by these supplement companies saying that, well, you can't get all the vitamins and minerals you need uh, through the food you eat, and that is absolutely marketing. Um, and they've even done studies in athletes who are, you know, have very high met metabolic rates and try to determine if, you know, taking a supplement improved their outcomes. And unless you're an Olympic athlete at the top 0.1% of your field, taking supplements really made no difference. And through just eating good food uh, and healthy foods, they were able to meet all their nutritional needs. So if athletes who are running 50 to 100 miles a week can get all their vitamins and minerals through food, I think most of us can as well, and that uh, these supplement companies are really marketing this concept that you can't uh, get it through food. So um, think about natural vitamins and minerals rather than uh, other ways. And then when you're eating, again, just be mindful of what, how you're eating. So just think for a second, um, if you were to eat this, uh, it looks like a donut of some kind, uh, you know, how long would you have to walk, okay, briskly to burn off the calories from this donut, which has almost no vitamins and minerals in it? Okay, so just think about it for a second. Write down that number. How many minutes would you have to walk? And the answer is you'd have to walk for about an hour uh, to burn off that that single donut. So, you know, how many of you were at Starbucks today and uh, are you jogging for 50 minutes? So, um, well, you just need to make healthier choices. And it's not saying that you can't have your Starbucks or your popcorn. Uh, I think that you just want to be mindful and moderate uh, how much you intake and then make sure that, you know, if you are going to have that donut on the weekend, hopefully you're going out for a run or a jog that day as well to counterbalance uh, that as well. Okay, so uh, again, here's another study looking at things like physical activity. And again, uh, the point of all these studies consistently showing that things like physical activity do improve overall outcomes for patients. Uh, this is a, a study done in patients post-surgery uh, for pancreatic cancer showing that those who engaged in an exercise program early on had improvements in fatigue, pain, and physical symptoms. So they're really able to recover much faster and better uh, and I think there's growing data, not only in pancreatic cancer, but many other types of cancer as well, that it's important, even through treatment, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, you need to stay active. Um, so think about your, uh, your assessment. You know, you should get your body mass index uh, calculator, which is a very easy thing to do. You can just Google BMI calculator. It's a combination of your height and weight. Uh, think about your waist circumference and monitor these things uh, and then incorporate regular nutrition, physical activity, uh, again, and you may want to uh, mix up your exercise program. So start with cardiovascular exercise uh, and slowly build that up, and then move toward resistance training, weight training. If you've been through treatment, you may need to consider supervision or monitoring. Um, so um, it's good to uh, incorporate all these aspects uh, as you go through this. Uh, from a mind-spirit standpoint, uh, you want to build from existing strengths. Uh, learn new skills. So um, just like meditation, um, just like, you know, learning golf or tennis, it takes time. Uh, meditation also takes time. And so uh, managing your stress is an important part of your health as well. Um, this is a study in breast cancer patients, uh, but it's, it illustrates how a simple thing like meditation can improve your sleep quality. And so I know sleep is uh, one of the things that are most commonly uh, disrupted when you're going through chemotherapy. And so rather than taking a pill, you can do something simple like meditation. Um, and then you need to stay socially active. So think about new hobbies, volunteering, trying something new, um, support groups. This is a support group um, in breast cancer patients, but it showed that when you were involved in a support group that advocated for good nutrition, healthy uh, physical activity, stress management, that alone itself can improve overall survival. 
Uh, there haven't been many studies in pancreatic cancer in part because it's not as common, but I, I think these findings are likely to be replicated in many other cancers, including in pancreatic cancer. So I'm just going to uh, summarize here and uh, have you focus on uh, kind of a comprehensive model as you uh, think about a treatment plan that should incorporate uh, as aggressively all the conventional therapies as there are the supportive and integrative therapies that exist. We talked about uh, different ways you can incorporate these things uh, from diagnosis into survivorship. Um, one thing I would say is that when you're going through treatment, you really uh, need to focus on treatment, and you, you really don't need to be meeting all the guidelines uh, through treatment um, because that can be a quite challenging period of time. But it's something that you want to be meeting guidelines, say, 6 to 12 months after treatment as you recover, um, and that what you're doing during treatment is trying to maintain as much as possible um, if you're able to meet the guidelines, great. If you're not, that's okay. Uh, but then six to 12 months after you finish all your treatments, hopefully you're, you're reaching the American Cancer Society guidelines on survivorship. So think about uh, building a comprehensive care plan, uh, meeting all the different dimensions of your health, uh, looking for natural options, uh, being very careful about a lot of the common um, myths out there about the integrative therapies that exist uh, and try to go for the most natural approaches uh, that are going to be safe and evidence-based for you. All right, so, um, again, emphasizing evidence-based, balance, true natural options, personalize that to your care, and make sure you're doing things that you enjoy. I uh, just also want to, um, if you're interested in this field of integrative oncology, uh, I'm part of the organization, Society for Integrative Oncology, we do have our meeting. Uh, in uh, Florida. It's a horrible time to be in Florida in November, I know. Uh, but anyway, if you're interested, this is a, a conference that's um, uh, very focused on the research and being evidence-based. So with that, uh, I'm going to end, and, and thanks for your uh, attention today, and then I know we have time for uh, questions as well. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, you are correct. We will now begin the question answer portion of the presentation. Um, and as a reminder, you may ask any online questions at any time by simply entering your question into the Q&A panel in the bottom right-hand corner and clicking send. Please leave the send to default as all panelists. We will try to get as, to as many questions as possible in the allocated time, but we may not get to every question and we will be prioritizing the questions that are related to today's topic and that are more general in nature. So the first question for Dr. Lee is, um, actually based off of one of your last slides, what are the reliable resources for finding information on supplements or other complementary and alternative medicines? So good question about uh, finding reliable resources. Um, I think that um, the resources to look at would be things like the American Cancer Society, National Cancer Institute, um, looking at Memorial Sloan Kettering's uh, website or MD Anderson's. Uh, I think you want to focus on um, nonprofit um, kind of organizations that are really trying to distribute um, scientifically grounded information. Uh, these are probably the best uh, resources. Um, anytime you are reading something or, you, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you get um, recommendations from your neighbor, your friends, family, about things you should try, look very carefully about who is um, really providing those recommendations. Uh, I'll give you a good example. I had a, a patient who told me that, well, this is coming from some kind of cancer institute for research, and they seem very reputable. And then when I went to the website to look at uh, who it was, it was kind of very hard to figure out who ran the organization. And when I did, when I looked up the physicians that were involved, the physicians seemed to be very involved with all supplement companies. So it seemed to be kind of a front for the supplement companies to make it look like they were doing research to advocate for their own supplements. So uh, I think just be very wary and cautious and try to stay with these major national organizations. Great. Thank you. And the next question is, um, are there any specific supplements that you should avoid if you have pancreatic cancer? So, uh, supplements to avoid. Um, now, I think that's a good question. And, uh, you know, I would say that 
you know, you definitely want to avoid supplements that have already been studied and shown to be harmful. So, uh, you know, we were talking about antioxidants, and it, it's probably more likely to increase your chance for cancer or recurrence than it is to prevent it. Um, and, and so that's something to be aware about. And uh, there's, a, you know, literally hundreds of supplements out there. Um, so I, I think that it's really a black box about the majority of them. So the, really the question is, are there supplements that you might want to consider? So, um, you know, it really depends on each patient. Um, have you had, um, you know, have you had your uh, pancreas taken out, um, and which then might lead to digestion and absorption issues? Um, for individuals who've had surgery, uh, you need to be working with a dietitian to really identify what your nutritional needs are, and depending on the type of surgery you had, what nutritional deficiencies you might run into. So might you need a, a simple multivitamin like uh, Centrum? Uh, I think that's reasonable for uh, some patients, especially if they've had a major uh, Whipple surgery. Um, but does that mean everybody needs to be on a multivitamin? No, it does not. Uh, it's really identifying those individuals who might have um, digestion or absorption issues. Um, it's probably worthwhile to have your vitamin D level checked. There's some data that it might be uh, beneficial, although it's not really clear yet, um, but I think you should have a normal vitamin D, and if your vitamin D level is low, then you probably need supplementation. Um, outside of this, um, I think that it's really identifying nutritional deficiencies uh, and, then, uh, and then supplementing. I generally do not recommend everyone just, ran, you know, everyone should be on, you know, I see patients who, everyone's on vitamin D 5,000. Well, you know, if your vitamin D level is normal, actually you may not need it. Um, and if your vitamin D is really low, well, maybe you need more than 5,000. So I always recommend uh, having your levels checked or being evaluated to determine uh, what's needed. Uh, and, again, that's very individual. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we also have a question about ketogenic diets. Um, so the low-carb, high-fat diets, and if there's mm -hmm. a role for those in pancreatic cancer patients. So uh, I, think, I think that it needs to be studied further. Uh, there are researchers here um, at uh, Case Western University of Hospitals who are looking at it for patients with brain cancer where the data really started from. But unfortunately, it's been um, picked up, and now people are trying to apply it to all cancers. Um, and I think there's not enough data to say outside of brain cancer whether it's really helpful or not. Uh, a true ketogenic diet is actually uh, not easy to uh, comply with and maintain um, because, it, you know, one or two, you know, actually I think one or two meals with carbohydrates can take you out of ketosis. Um, and uh, the other uh, issue is that a high-protein, high-fat diet for pancreatic cancer patients, well, fat and it's one of the hardest things for pancreatic cancer patients to digest. So I've had patients who try to go on a ketogenic diet and actually just make their abdominal symptoms worse because they, they don't have good pancreatic function to begin with. So for pancreatic patients in particular, I, I think it's actually quite challenging and, and probably maybe just as harmful because you're already having trouble digesting food, especially fatty foods. So uh, my recommendation is not to pursue a ketogenic diet until there's more data um, because you're likely to make your, your GI issues actually worse. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another question um, related to the consumption of dairy products, increasing levels of insulin growth factor, um, which may accelerate cancer growth. So the question is, is this true, or is there any research supporting this, um, this myth? About dairy products, is that right? Yes, about dairy products increasing insulin growth factor um, that accelerates cancer growth. Yeah, well, I, I think that um, I, I get a lot of questions about dairy, and I know there's something called the China study, and you know all animal products, including dairy, should be avoided. Uh, I actually do not recommend this. Neither does the American Cancer Society or American Institute of Cancer Research. Uh, I think that it's not really clear. Uh, whether or not dairy has any kind of harmful effects. Um, especially, I don't think the studies, um, for instance, that look at animal products really differentiate between, say, dairy that might be organic and hormone-free and free of other chemicals versus kind of the more common dairy that might have hormones and other chemicals in there. So um, I think that's one issue that needs to be uh, figured out. And additionally, if you look at studies of, say, for instance, there is um, a large study going on in Europe 
looking at the Mediterranean style diet, which does include a little bit of dairy in moderation, um, they're not showing any potential harms. If anything, the Mediterranean style diet seems to be quite healthy and beneficial and reduces the risk of cancer. So, um, you know, I think this issue of eliminating dairy is not clear. And, um, you know, there are diets like the Mediterranean diet that, that does have dairy in moderation. So uh, I think that it's okay to have some dairy. I think you just need to have good quality dairy in your, if you're going to have, like, milk or cheese or uh, yogurt, make sure it's with good quality without extra hormones and added sugar and all these other things and other chemicals. Uh, and you have to do so in moderation. Great. Thank you. Um, we also have a few questions about curcumin and how beneficial is curcumin to patients with pancreatic cancer? Mm, yeah, good question. Oh, let me actually, let me just, uh, one more thing to add in about the instant growth factor. I mean, instant growth factor is released anytime you're having a meal. So it's going to be released if you have a meal with carbohydrates, right? So uh, insulin is something that's used as part of a metabolism to help regulate um, growth and also, uh, you know, insulin's regulating your blood sugar levels. So uh, people are studying IGF and it's important and, and its importance in cancer development. Um, so I don't think that's specific to dairy. So I think those are really two different issues. Um, but I don't think we've been able to target IGF pathways quite yet, uh, but I know there are many things uh, under clinical trials at this time. Now, uh, the question here being about curcumin. So uh, people uh, are studying curcumin. Uh, and there has been, there was a phase two clinical trial done at MD Anderson where I used to work. Um, the response rate was not, um, and, and they were using very high, high doses, you know, like 8,000 grams a day. Um, and they only had two or three patients and a small phase two of patients respond, but nobody was cured. And the responses generally were short lived, uh, maybe lasting a few months. So uh, I think that although curcumin has a lot of preclinical studies, the clinical studies have yet to be really promising. And I can tell you that I've, I've had patients with pancreatic cancer and other types of cancers try curcumin. I have yet to come across any kind of substantial response. So uh, I think I'm still waiting to see more definitive um, clinical data on curcumin. Um, I think it's fine if you want to cook with it or, um, you know, put it in your foods. You know, eat, it's involved in a lot of Southeast Asian food. Um, but would I recommend taking a pill of it? Uh, I think um, generally I would not recommend it um, if, because, again, taking the pill, concentrated form, if you're on treatment, I don't know if there's drug-drug interactions or other issues you might run into. Great. Thank you. Um, we also have a few questions about probiotics. Um, so one question is, are probiotics helpful with, the, with patients diagnosed with pancreatic cancer? So, yes, I think that's just one of the hot areas right now, people talking about the microbiome and um, the benefits. Um, so I, I think probiotics can be helpful in, in the sense that it might help you reestablish your microbiome after surgery or after um, a period of antibiotics. Um, but do you need to be on probiotics all the time? Um, generally not. I don't think there's any data that, say, you know, taking a probiotic all the time is really needed. Or helpful. Um, and remember, you, you can get great amounts of probiotics through food. So things like, uh, you know, Greek yogurt, kefir, fermented foods like sauerkraut, or um, have a lot of probiotics naturally. And so I would say get your probiotics through foods you eat. Um, and that, and, you know, extra doses or exogenous kind of probiotics um, is not really clear um, outside of those patients who might have had recent surgery or antibiotics. And it's probably, you know, if you look at the studies, I recently saw a um, speaker from Stanford talking about the microbiome. Uh, what he found was that, you know, after you take antibiotics, your microbiome does shift in terms of the population, but after several weeks, it'll shift, generally shift back almost close to normal, um, even without any additional probiotics. So your, your body was probably as important, uh, probably more important than probiotics is the diet you're eating. And are you eating, are you exercising? You know, these things are probably all more important factors in terms of keeping your microbiome healthy. Great, thank you. We have two questions that kind of go hand in hand, so I'm going to lump them together. Um, so number one, um, is there a recommendation um, to stop taking all dietary supplements when a patient is actively undergoing chemotherapy and or radiation therapy? And just to add to that, how would you suggest that patients have the, the conversation about complementary alternative medicines um, when they're going through treatment with their doctor? 
Right. So uh, generally, my uh, approach is, especially during treatment, is to keep things as simple and safe as possible. So um, if you feel that you absolutely have to have all these supplements, uh, I would say, yes, you should stop them during surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy. The risk for drug-drug interactions is so high, and you're going to be taking so many other medicines. Um, just adding, you know, five more pills is not, uh, you know, you're probably going to run into some issues. So, um, but you have to work closely with your dietitian to figure out, well, maybe if you're iron deficient or B12 deficient, you know, um, well, may, maybe you need to be on these things. So, uh, again, each patient is different, and you need to identify your needs. And, and if you do have identified deficiencies, well, then likely you need to stay on these supplements during the treatment. Um, but if you don't have any known deficiencies, then, yes, I, I would really question whether you need to be on uh, many supplements, of any at all. Um, and then um, in terms of bringing up the conversation, uh, I, I would suggest, you know, just being open and honest and, and telling your um, – physicians that, you know, I'm interested in having an integrative approach and want to think about, you know, nutrition and exercise, and is there somebody I can speak with? Um, and many centers, many of the major centers, I should say, are, are now uh, starting programs in integrative oncology so that hopefully there will be a local expert that can help you. Um, I can tell you that it's, it's quite variable in terms of what's out there. Um, in terms of, of kind of the types of practices, uh, I would strongly suggest you try to stay close to a academic center uh, in getting advice. Um, Ninety-eight percent of the time when I have patients come see me and they've seen someone who's not as academically inclined, I, I just find that they walk out with a bag of supplements and uh, not necessarily good advice. And the supplements often include high doses of vitamin E, beta carotene, folates, and um, it's unfortunate because, uh, you know, they, they actually might be doing some harm. Thank you. Um, we have a question about um, monitoring pH levels in the body. So the question is, is there a benefit to monitoring acid and alkaline levels with pH strips as part of an integrative therapy or integrative monitoring mm -hmm. during yeah, so back. these are the one of the two top questions I get on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm glad someone asked. So it's a, about alkalinization. So this is one of the most kind of misinformed areas out there. So uh, the statement is that you know cancer can't grow in an alkaline environment, uh, which is kind of a half truth. The other half that you need to know is that normal cells in your body wouldn't be able to grow in an alkaline environment. So uh, for anyone who might be uh, in the medical field, the normal pH of the blood, which has to be measured with a special arterial blood gas, is 7.4. And um, if, you know, if I took out your cells and put them in a Petri dish and made uh, the environment of a pH of 8, you know, these normal cells would not grow very well because uh, normal cells are meant to function at 7.4. And so, um, and what's interesting is that the body pH is very tightly controlled. So the normal range for body pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So that's 0 0.05 leeway in either direction, right? So it tells you that, you know, it's very tightly controlled. And patients who have, say, a pH of 7.5, just one-tenth of a pH degree higher, if, you, if I give you a magic pill that made your body 7.5, you would be really ill and you would probably be in the hospital, you know, that night. Um, and the same goes true if it was slightly acidic, 7.3, you would be in the hospital uh, because the body just can't operate outside the normal range. So, um, and then when they tell you you need to monitor your urine, you know, to see your body's pH, you know, it's not reflecting your body's pH. So, you know, th you, what you want to do is think about this. Um, if I gave a patient... Uh, sodium bicarb water to drink, or very alkaline water to drink. Within hours of drinking this type of water, the urine will become very alkaline. But why would the body's urine become alkaline? Well, urine is a way to excrete toxins and excess items. So what's actually happening is if you drink alkaline water and you test your urine, it becomes alkaline. It's not that your body's become alkaline. 
your body is actually trying to eliminate excess alkalinity in the system to get back to a pH of 7.4, right? So, and the same would be true if I had you drink, uh, it's funny, people say, oh, I'm going to alkalinize my body, and they say, I'm going to drink uh, apple cider vinegar, but vinegar is usually acidic. Um, but what would happen if you drink vinegar within hours, your urine would become acidic for the same reason. Your body's eliminating excess acidity out of the system. So all you're really doing is stressing your, your kidneys and your body to get back to normal. And, you know, especially if you're in treatment, you don't want to cause excess stress on the system. So, and I've seen patients uh, do this. They, they can actually cause um, electrolyte abnormalities if they take too much alkaline um, intake and for a long period of time, it, it will have an effect on the body, so, uh, and, and a negative effect, I should say. So don't worry about this alkalinity issue. Just drink uh, normal, neutral water and eat a healthy diet. That's more important than the pH of the water you're drinking. It's a, really just a waste of resources. Great, thank you. Um, we also have a question about foods that cause inflammation and how ha there's been um, some research around how they're harmful and can actually cause cancer. So number one, the question is, is this true? And if so, which foods can actually decrease inflammation or not aid or not cause inflammation? Yeah, so inflammation, uh, people are looking at it. I think inflammation is a very kind of vague process and it's not really clear uh, what's the best way to manage inflammation. Um, because inflammation, uh, you know, whether or not inflammation, it probably plays a role in the development of some types of cancers, um, but it's not that easily controlled. Um, and at the same time, inflammation is very related to the immune system, right? So patients who have autoimmune disorders like lupus, or rheumatoid arthritis, that's an overactive immune system. So um, you know, you could just give everyone steroids, which is a great anti-inflammatory, but, you know, long-term use of steroids actually will suppress the immune system, right? The inflammation is being caused by immune cells. Uh, it's, they're an integral part of the inflammatory process. So, um, you know, so you have to be very cautious about when people talk about inflammation and just down-regulating or controlling it. It's, it's not that easy without having other undue side effects. And then in regards to foods, well, if you look at what are the foods that are generally unhealthy, so fried foods, a lot of red meat, and, um, you know, uh, behaviors such as smoking and alcohol all cause inflammation. So I think the key here is uh, focus on healthy habits, healthy foods. Uh, they generally are associated with less inflammation. And those foods which are unhealthy, and part of the reason they're probably unhealthy is they also cause a degree of inflammation. So I, I would focus on those aspects as well. Uh, let me also answer the, uh, the second most common question I get all the time, which is related to nutrition, is sugar. People always ask about sugar. Does sugar feed cancer? And, you know, do I have to, uh, you know, go back? Uh, we're talking about a ketogenic diet. So, um, but you have to remember, again, this is a misinformed question or statement that does sugar feed cancer? Well, yes, it's true. Glucose is a sugar, and glucose is the fuel of the body. So does sugar feed every normal cell of the body? Well, yes, it does, and it does also feed cancer cells. So um, you can't eliminate sugar out of the bloodstream. I mean, if you have a friend with diabetes, and they gave themselves too much insulin, and their sugar, blood sugar level went below 50 or 40, you, you, what would happen is you would pass out because the body would stop functioning. Um, and so this issue of sugar is really about uh, what types of sugars are you eating? Are you getting sugars from candy bars and sodas? Are you getting sugars from, you know, fruits and vegetables? Because fruits and vegetables have sugars. So, and carbohydrates are broken down into sugars. So um, what you, again, want to focus on is healthy eating. Uh, what types of foods are you, you eating? Where are they coming from? Are they natural versus processed? That's what you really want to focus on, not so much about just sugars in general. It's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a very complex issue, and I think a lot of these companies are marketing products and trying to simplify something that you, you, can't, you can't simplify in a simple statement. Thank you. And we have time for one more question, and we've had a few of these questions come in. So um, do you have any experience using um, medicinal cannabis with pancreatic cancer patients and for side effect management or any other um, uses in this population? All right. Yeah, another very uh, popular question, especially recently with uh, many states uh, legalizing medical marijuana. 
So uh, there is data that um, marijuana derivatives, specifically uh, THC, tetrahydrocannabinoids, I believe, um, can help with appetite and nausea. Um, and so what I would suggest to um, uh, viewers and listeners is that uh, there is an FDA-approved prescription synthesized THC called Marinol, and it is approved for appetite stimulation and for nausea management. And so um, rather than uh, getting, you know, marijuana um, kind of off the market, uh, especially in these medical marijuana markets, uh, I think you have to be very cautious. One, you never want to smoke marijuana because it's full of carcinogens, so you would negate any benefits from there. <clears throat> Two, this is a true story. I had a patient in California who I was prescribing Marinol for, and he said, oh, you know, I'll just get medical marijuana. I've got a dispensary down the street. I'm just going to buy some cookies and brownies. And then he came back six months later and he said, oh, can I get a prescription again? I said, well, why? He said, well, you know, I was buying these cookies, and um, – and they were working, but then one week I bought the exact same cookie from the exact same place, and I took one bite of the cookie, and I was hallucinating. And clearly they had done something different that week, um, and he didn't know uh, what had happened, but he just said it wasn't worth it. Uh, and so he just went back on the prescription because he knew exactly what he was going to get. It was quality controlled. He, you know, he was safe. He didn't have to worry about um, kind of being confused and, and hallucinating. So, um, and, and specifically about cannabis oil, I know there's a lot of buzz about cannabis oil specifically having anti-cancer activity. Uh, I think that's way premature. There are studies ongoing. Uh, I have yet to come across uh, a patient, and I've had many patients using cannabis oil. Uh, I've had patients, you know, go to California, spend $15,000 on a bottle of cannabis oil that's supposed to cure them, uh, and it's not happened. And uh, unfortunately, again, I think that these... Uh, Places are really preying upon your situation and trying to sell you a product that has no data. Um, you know, do I think it may have some medicinal uh, side effects in, in terms of managing your symptoms? Yes. Do I think it's going to cure cancer? No. Uh, I, I haven't seen any data to really support that. So, uh, again, I would just uh, express caution and realize that, uh, you know, there is a prescription medication legal in all 50 states. You don't have to worry about traveling or hiding it, or and it's quality controlled, uh, and it has shown benefit for uh, nausea and appetite. So I, I would suggest that to be the safest route. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So we would like to thank Dr. Lee for his excellent presentation. The PowerPoint slides and a recording of this webinar will be available at pancan.org under the educational events page. There may be a delay of several days before the information is posted. Your patience is appreciated. Once again, we would like to thank our webinar sponsor, Lily Oncology. Please take a moment to share your feedback on the survey that appears once you leave the session. If you have questions, please contact Patient Central at 877-272-6226 and ask to speak to an associate. This concludes the webinar. Thank you for attending.